Good morning, Pine City Free Church family and friends. We thank you today for joining us on YouTube for our online church service. I pray that it is a blessing to you. I pray your faith is encouraged and that you are challenged to walk with Jesus in a deeper way because of having watched today. I want to start this morning with some scripture from the book of Psalms. The psalmist writes in Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. That is whom we come to worship this morning. The great God of all gods, the great King of all kings, the great Lord of all lords, We come to worship today our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who in love and mercy and grace came to take our sin on the cross and bear the punishment of our sins. We worship Him today. And so as we do that today, I pray that you will be blessed. I pray you'll consider your own life and where you are with God and that your relationship with Him will be enriched. Let us pray together. Our Father, we come this morning and we confess that You are our great God, that You are our great King, that You are our great Lord. As the book of Hebrews says, You are our great High Priest. Lord, we just are so grateful for Your character and who You are. And God, we are so grateful for Your grace that in love You sent Your Son, Jesus, to come to take on human flesh, to live a sinless life, to die in our place on the cross, to take our sins and to pay the penalty for our sins and to rise again gloriously three days later. Lord, we are so grateful for that plan that you put into place to save us and to bring us to yourself. I pray, God, that if there's someone listening this morning that has never turned to Christ as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day they would come to you in faith and repentance. They would turn to you and trust you as their Lord and Savior, and God, that you would save them. And I pray for those of us who may know you, God, but many times in our lives we, we don't follow hard after you. I pray that today we would consider what it means to be your followers, that, God, we would follow you, that we would, as your word says, we would take up our cross daily and follow you, and that you would be glorified in us. Bless our time together today, Lord. May all that's sung and prayed and done honor and glorify our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we ask it. Good morning and welcome to our worship service. We're going to start out with a classic hymn that many of you love called And Can It Be? This is a song that was written by a man named Charles Wesley who uh, through most of his life he, learned, he read the Bible, he learned about Christianity, he knew all about the religion, but he didn't encounter Christ until he was in his 30s. And it was after he met Christ and had a personal relationship with him that this song came pouring out. So let's sing this together and sing of God's amazing love.
that's bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused the quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. Thy chains fell off. The scripture comes from Psalm 145, 8 through 17. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame. Now robed in majesty. The radiance of shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise held us now gives way to him who gives our peace his final breath upon the cross is now alive in me your name your name is there. 
If you have a Bible this morning, whatever form you may have, whether it's a paper copy or, or a phone or an iPad or a computer, I would encourage you to turn to John chapter 15. If you remember, a few weeks ago before our wonderful graduation service, we looked at John 15 verses 1 through 11 and what it meant to abide in or to live in the presence of Jesus. Today we're going to look at this same passage, but we're going to look at verses 12 through 17 and the importance of friendship with Jesus. So listen to what Jesus says here in John chapter 15, verse 12. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is God's Word. Let me ask you today, who was your best friend growing up? Can you remember that? I wonder who is your best friend now. For me, growing up, my best friend was my neighbor, Jerry. He literally lived in the house right next to me in New Jersey. And Jerry and I were kind of, uh, we were always together We were just attached at the hip, I think, sometimes. Always doing something together. Um, 
we did sometimes get in trouble together. I mean, that's part of sometimes growing up as a boy. And, and like in all relationships, we had our occasional little fights. But the amazing thing is we always remained friends. And the great thing is that we still remain friends even to this day. But my best friend now is without a doubt my wife Janine. She is the one who knows me best and yet she continues to stay with me. She is my best friend. Now, you know, a true friend is someone that you can trust. It's someone you can be yourself with. It is someone that you can share your heart with, your deepest desires. Someone who will be there for you in the darkest times of life. See, as human beings, we have several basic needs. And, but two of the big ones are purpose and companionship. When we think about purpose, it's the idea that we need to have a cause that's worth living for. We need to have a goal or an aim in our lives. And we do all need that in our lives. But companionship is really a, speaks of a comrade, a friend. Speaks of someone to share life with. And the amazing thing is this. That both of these basic human needs are met supremely in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is the greatest of all friends. As Proverbs 18.24 tells us, He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And if you think about the music that we've listened to, the music that we sing, you think about classic hymns and even contemporary songs, they, they, several of them celebrate this incredible truth about Jesus being the greatest friend of all. Think about this. The old hymn says, what a friend we have in Jesus. How about Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Another one says, I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. Another hymn says, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And even thinking about contemporary songs, one of my favorite songs of all time is by Casting Crowns, and their song is simply titled, Jesus, Friend of Sinners. But when we think about this idea of friendship with Christ, we've got to be careful too, because we don't want to be too chummy about it. We don't want to be overly sentimental about this idea of friendship with Christ and calling Jesus our friend. See, here... In this passage, Jesus calls his disciples friends, yes, but he also reminds them that he is still their Lord and their teacher and their master. And and think about this, even John, the author of this passage, although we read about the fact that at the Last Supper he would lean his head against Jesus' chest, we also know that later on, when John would see Jesus in his glory, he would literally fall down before him in the book of Revelation chapter 1. So as we consider whether or not we are the friends of Jesus, we need to make sure we maintain the same kind of reverence that John had. The question I want to ask today is simply this. Would Jesus call me his friend? Would Jesus call you his friend? And our text today kind of gives us a profile of what is involved with being involved in friendship with Jesus. The first thing we see is this. Friendship with Jesus involves practicing love for each other in verses 12 and 13 and 17. It involves practicing love for each other. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time here. I want to park here for just a minute because this is really the key thrust of these verses Jesus spoke these words this night in the upper room. It was after he had enjoyed the Last Supper with his disciples. It was after he had washed their feet. And it's obvious what comes from this passage, as well as the the chapters before, is that Jesus really cared that his disciples loved one another. In John 13, Jesus would say this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then he says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now really, there's two things in this passage to consider about our love for one another within the body of Christ. The first thing is this. This is a command of Jesus. 
I mean, I don't know how else to put it. This is a command of Jesus. Verses 12 and verse 17 use that word command. That it's a command that we love one another. It's kind of a love sandwich in this passage. It starts with the idea of love one another. It ends with the idea of love one another. And they are commands from Christ. Here's what's going on in this passage. We learn that the will of Jesus for his followers is mutual love toward one another. And it is not optional, it is actually essential that Jesus' followers love one another. Now, we might think, well, wait a minute, how can you legislate love? How can you really command love? Can Jesus really command us to love? And they may be fair questions to ask in certain ways, but they also point to our incredible cultural misunderstanding of what love is, and especially Christian love. We need to remember that the love that Jesus calls us to here is not just a feeling. It goes so much deeper than that. It is actually an act of the will. Romans 5 tells us that the proof of God's love can be seen in the fact that Jesus died on the cross, which, folks, was an act of God's will. See, the proof of our love for one another is not found in our feelings. It's not just a, a mushy, sentimental thing. Real Christian love is an act of the will. Ultimately, it is an act of obedience to Christ and His Word. So it is a command. But the second thing is, not only is it a command, but... Jesus' love for us is the standard of how we are to love one another. I mean, the standard is not love one another if you like one another. It's not love one another if you think alike. It's not like one another if others love you. It's not like one another if you have lots of things in common. No, it is simply this. It goes so much deeper. It is to love one another. In verse 12, Jesus gives us the standard for this love. He says we are to love one another as I have loved you. And then in verse 13, he shows us exactly what that love is like. When he says this, he says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. See, Jesus knew, the disciples didn't know this yet, but Jesus knew that that is exactly what he was preparing to do for his followers. He was preparing to die for them. And he knew that that would be the greatest expression of love in all the universe. That would be the expression of the heart of God and the love of God. At this point, I don't think the disciples really truly understood the full meaning of what Jesus is saying. But I do know that later they would understand because this same Apostle John would write in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, kind of mimicking this passage, he would say, By this we know love, that he did laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. See, love, true love, God's love, the love that Jesus is calling us to here, is defined by what Jesus did on the cross. It is the ultimate expression of love, and it is the standard by which we are to love one another. So if we want to love as Jesus loved, we have to love with a sacrificial, self-denying kind of love. Because really, uh, such an essential part of, of living a gospel-centered life, a living a life that follows after Jesus, is this idea of a loving community that we share within the church. And we share it not because it's easy, or because it's convenient, or because it's perfect, or because other people loved us first. No, we love one another in the body of Christ because Jesus loved us first. His is the standard and the example. And yes, I understand sometimes in the church that's hard. But let's think about the, the beginning church. Let's think about the early church. Let's think about the church that Jesus established with his disciples. Sometimes we romanticize what the early church was like or what the disciples were like. But let's think about this. Think about Jesus' apostles. He did not choose people to follow him that were just like one another. 
Do you know that? I mean, they were all different, and some more different than others. And want to talk about a big difference? Think about these two people. Think about Matthew, the tax collector, and then think about Simon, the zealot. Now, those words, I don't know if they mean a lot to you, but let me explain. Zealots, Simon was a zealot, zealots was this radical political party whose number one goal was to overthrow the Roman government, was to kick them out of the Holy Land. And they viewed tax collectors like Matthew as absolutely despicable traitors who had used and abused their authority to hurt their own people. They had taken advantage of people. And, and so these two people are on, I mean, extreme opposite ends of the spectrum. And Jesus calls them both to himself. I don't know which one Jesus called first. I don't know if he called Matthew first or if he called Simon first. But could you just imagine what it would have been like as Matthew or Simon, whichever one was called first, sees the other one being called to Jesus to follow him and to respond to him, to follow him? They must have thought something like, wait a minute, why is he calling him? Doesn't he know what he was doing? I mean, what is he thinking? And then to top it all off, Jesus commands those two men to love one another then you know what god still does that today he still picks people for his church that some of us may have never picked and he commands us to say no to our own self-interest to our own selfishness and to love them as an example to this lost selfish hate-filled world the bottom line from these verses is this. Friends of Jesus love one another just as he loved us. So friendship with Jesus involves loving one another. Secondly, friendship with Jesus involves living in obedience to him. Verse 14, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And that kind of repeats the thought of verse 10 that we read last, a couple weeks ago, where Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. See, friendship with Jesus cannot be disconnected from obeying His commands. However, it is important for us to understand, it's not that our obedience makes us friends of Jesus. It's not if we do these things, we can become friends of Jesus. No, we cannot earn a relationship with Jesus. What Jesus is saying here is that our obedience to Him is what characterizes that we are His friends. In other words, if we do what Jesus commands. And remember, the context here is loving one another. If we do what Jesus commands, that proves that we are His disciples. Again, as John wrote in John 13, 35, where Jesus said, by this all men will know you're my disciples, if you love one another. That is where the proof is that we obey him. Now, ultimately, Jesus, as God, has the right to command his disciples and to command us to absolute obedience in following him. But in saying that, I, I'm sure the disciples probably thought, now, wait a minute. If you call us to, you just told us we're friends. You're telling us to love one another, but yet you're calling us to obey you. How does that make us friends? Doesn't that appear that we're more servants or slaves? I mean, isn't demanding absolute obedience really the role of a servant or a slave, not a friend? And that leads us to the third principle, and it is this. Friendship with Jesus also invo involves enjoying closeness with him. Verse 15, he says this, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. The term servant there is the Greek word doulos, which can be literally translated as slave. And in the ancient world, a slave or a servant, was they were simply told what to do and they were expected to do it. They were not given reasons. They were just expected to obey. And, and in some respects, the disciples are also told what to do and expected to obey. But there's a big difference. The big difference is that these disciples were not only expected to obey, but they had also been called into a close, 
intimate, deep relationship with Jesus where He would reveal His heart, where He would reveal His mind, His plans, and His purposes to them. There's a great biblical illustration of this in Genesis chapter 18, dealing with Abraham. Abraham is called throughout the Scripture a friend of God. And so think about this. In Genesis 18, the Lord comes and two angels with Him. They show up at Abraham's tent and they're, they're coming to look and investigate the sin of Sodom. And so Abraham, who is over a hundred years old at this point, he greets these visitors. He starts to see to their comfort. He starts to wait on them. He makes them this wonderful meal. He feeds them this incredible meal. And like a true servant, he waits on them and meets their needs and, and makes himself available to them as a servant. Well, then in the last part of the chapter, the, the, the story kind of turns a little bit. And we see Abraham just communing with the Lord, just praying, just spending time before the Lord's presence. And he's still a servant, but he's being talked to like a friend. And then God does something incredible. God says within the fellowship of his own unique person, he says, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Think about that for a minute. God's getting ready to rain fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. But before he does it, he asks, should I really hide this from my servant and my friend Abraham? What God does is he shares his heart with Abraham. And that is what Jesus does with his disciples in John 15. He shares his heart with them. But he does remind his disciples that although they're in this privileged position, although they're called friends, That was not of their own doing. It wasn't that they woke up one day and decided, I think I'm going to be Jesus' friend. No, they were invited into it. It was all because of God's grace in Christ. He says, He chose them. They did not choose Him. And for us today, in response to Jesus' invitation, we are given a choice to enter into that friendship and closeness with Christ. We're privileged. Think about this, folks. We're privileged to be invited into a relationship and friendship with the sovereign God of the universe, the creator of all things. We're invited into this abiding relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. And we're also invited to get to know His heart and His mind. Where do we find that? We find that in His Word. But we also find His heart and His mind in communion with His Spirit. So think about this, folks. Friends of Jesus love one another. Friends of Jesus obey Jesus' commands. Friends of Jesus enjoy closeness with Him. And then the final profile is this. Friendship with Jesus involves bearing fruit for Him. Verse 16, Jesus says, You did not choose Me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Again, just like a couple weeks ago, we're introduced to this word fruit. And remember, as branches in the beginning of John 15, we share in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? We abide in him. We share in his life. We bear fruit. Here, as friends of Jesus, we share in his life and we bear fruit, just like the illustration of the vine and the branches. See, Jesus chose these disciples to be his friends with a specific plan and purpose in mind, and that was to bear fruit for his kingdom and for his glory. And it is the same thing with us. I like what Ray Ortland said. He said, We are Christians saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but... That grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, refuses to remain alone. We reproduce. We produce fruit. And here, fruit means fruit that will last. Fruit that will abide, Jesus says. Fruit that will stand the test of time. And that's an interesting figure because we all know fruit doesn't last. I mean, you buy fruit off the vine, you pick it or whatever, and buy in the grocery store, you set it down, and it is going to spoil, it is going to go bad. But Jesus says there is fruit in his kingdom that will remain 
that will last. And what is the fruit that remains? The New Testament describes several things. First of all, godly attitudes, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Righteous living is a fruit, according to Philippians chapter 1. Our praise to God is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to Him, according to Hebrews chapter 13. And probably mostly what Jesus had in mind in this passage is leading others to faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, what we do as we follow Jesus is we point people to the life and the hope that is available in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the way Christianity spreads. It's encouraging others to come to Christ. We know that Jesus saves, but we encourage others. We show them the love of God through the character of Christ that is in our own lives. We show them the fruit of the Christian life. They see the fruit of the Spirit welling up inside of us. They see our righteous life. They hear our praise. And what that does is that earns us a hearing in people's lives so that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. We are called to bear fruit. Friends of Jesus bear fruit for His kingdom and for His glory. So this morning I want to close with a question. The question is simply this. Would Jesus call you His friend? That's the first question I asked in the beginning as well. Would Jesus call you His friend? Now before you answer in your mind, I want you to understand something. According to the Scripture, we need to know that Jesus is not automatically our friend, nor is He everyone's friend. And we especially need to know this if we think that somehow we can be Jesus' friend because we're good people, because we do good things. See, the Bible teaches us that all of us by nature are not Jesus' friends. In fact, by nature we are God's enemies because he is holy and all of us have sinned that's the bad news the bad news is the worst enemy we could possibly have is god because he always always wins but brothers and sisters listen here is the good news of the gospel it is this that god sent jesus to reconcile rebellious sinners like you and me to himself You see, the self-righteous religious crowd of Jesus' day, they scoffed at him. And when he was called the friend of sinners, they thought that was a term of, of derision. But Jesus gladly accepted that name and that title because he explained that he did not come to call the righteous, or really it's the self-righteous, those who think they're okay on their own and their good works. He didn't come to call them, no. He came to call sinners to repentance. So the first step in being called a friend of Jesus is simply this. It is to come to Jesus in repentance. Asking forgiveness for your sins. Asking Him to save you. And once you've done that, God promises whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When we repent from our sin and turn to Christ in faith, the Bible promises that He will save us. And then we can really truly begin to consider the profile that John gives here of what it means to be in friendship with Jesus. So, if you've not done that, if you've not repented of your sin and turned to faith in Christ, you can be His friend today by doing that, by turning to Him. But if you have repented and come to faith in Jesus, I would ask a couple, one more question. It's this, are you living as a friend of Jesus? Are you practicing love for your brothers and sisters in Christ, even those who may not be like you? Are you living in obedience to Christ, obeying His commands, even though maybe they're not listed the way you would have them listed? Are you enjoying closeness to Christ? Are you walking with Him? Do you know His Word and His will and His heart from His Word and from the fellowship of His Spirit? And are you bearing fruit for His kingdom? Is God using your life to bear fruit? Are you walking in the fruits of the Spirit? Are you pointing others to Jesus Christ? Let's pray.
Our Father, we are grateful for your word today. Lord, we are so privileged and honored and blessed to be able to say, you've chosen not to call us servants, but friends, and you've revealed to us what your heart is. You've revealed to us in your word all about who you are. You've revealed to us your plan for this world. You've revealed to us your plan for the church. You've revealed to us your plan for humanity. God, we're so grateful. And in those areas where we maybe don't know exactly what your plan is, you've given us your spirit to bring all things to our remembrance and to teach us all things. And Lord, we thank you for that. I pray, God, that this week we would walk in this world, in our families, in our communities, in our workplaces. We would walk as friends of Jesus, loving one another following you, obeying you, walking closely to you and bearing fruit for your kingdom and your glory. And God, if there's some listening that are not your friends because they've never turned to you in faith and repentance, they've never turned to Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray God today they would understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection that they would turn to you in faith, and God, that you would save them, adopt them into your family so that they could be called your friends. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy. We love you. Help us to love you more. In Christ's name, amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace you
Thank you so much for joining us on YouTube this morning for our online church service. I pray that it was a blessing to you. I pray you've been encouraged to really live out what it means to be in friendship with Jesus Christ. And I pray that even this week, you will walk as a friend of Christ as he calls us to. Let me close with the book of Jude as our benediction. Jude writes, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, for the presence of His glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace this week and follow Christ. Amen.